for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Yeah. But the next question was, uh, what are some of the major problems with the Big Bang Theory? Because I'm sure you hear them all. Yeah, the Big Bang, it's its its not really much of a, a theory. I guess you could call it a model it, because it doesn't really make testable predictions about uh, the universe, at least that have been specific and successful. Uh, some people think that the Big Bang predicted the cosmic microwave background. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of grant that, but it, it wasn't a very specific prediction because the the temperature that it predicted went from one degree Kelvin to 50 degree Kelvins. And the true answer of three Kelvins is, is in the right ballpark. But there was, you know, it's, it's like predicting that something will happen tomorrow and then something happens tomorrow and you say, see, that's evidence for my hypothesis. Maybe not so much. It doesn't make specific testable predictions that have been vindicated. And in fact, it predicted variations in the cosmic microwave background that are orders of magnitude larger than what we actually see. So it didn't even predict the right kind of microwave background. So it doesn't make good successful predictions. It's remarkably complicated in terms of all the uh, band-aids they've had to add to it to get it to be consistent, at least somewhat with the observable universe, like inflation. If you've heard of inflationary Big Bang, that's a patch to, um, to try and explain why we don't have uh, monopoles and why the universe has a sort of what we call a flat uh, topology to it. Uh, but, but the Big Bang didn't predict any of those things. So it doesn't make good, it's not a good theory at all. It's it's at best a hypothesis. And in terms of problems, it's got all kinds of problems with it. All, one that, all, that I like to mention just because it's easy to understand, it's called the baryon asymmetry problem or the baryon number problem. And basically the way you remember this is you ask the question, where's the antimatter? Uh, we can make matter on earth from energy. You can't. We can't make matter from nothing, only God can do that. But we can take energy, energy from a collisions of particles at, at extremely high speeds, close to the speed of light in particle accelerators. And from that energy, we can, we can create new particles. But every time you do that, you also get an antiparticle. So if you make an electron, you'll also make a positron, an anti-electron, which is the same as electron, but the charges of the particles are reversed. And so according to the Big Bang, the entire universe was originally energy. And then as it cooled, it became, uh, some of that energy became matter. But the problem is, according to everything we know about physics, you should get an equal amount, an exactly equal amount of antimatter. But when we look out into the universe, we find it's essentially matter only. There's only trace amounts of antimatter anywhere in the universe, and they're always produced locally anyway and almost immediately destroyed because when matter and antimatter touch, they, they tend to uh, annihilate each other and release uh, energy, especially in the form of photons. But uh, so the fact that our universe is matter only is it indicates that it was created not by a natural process, but by a supernatural process, because every natural process that converts energy into matter also produces an equal amount of antimatter. And that problem has not been solved in, in the secular worldview. I mean, there are proposals for it. The, the latest idea is that, well, every now and then, one time out of a quintillion, when energy becomes matter, there's no antimatter produced. It's just, it's matter only. So that they, that, but that hasn't been observed. That's just a, uh, a rescuing device. It hasn't, it's not something that has experimental support. So that's, that's one example. There are many others. There's a flatness problem and the, the monopole problem and inflation attempts to solve at least some of those, but it doesn't solve all of them. Uh, Dr. Law, you're touching on all the best points here. Um, I, I read about the, antimatter problem. I believe it was in your Taking Back Astronomy book. Um, so great answer there. And you also mentioned inflation. Is, is this the rescue device essentially for what's known as the horizon problem? That's right. It, the, the horizon problem is a light travel time problem that the uh, secular Big Bang, as it originally was proposed, had. And basically the problem is these microwaves, which secularists assume are the leftover radiation from the Big Bang. Well, microwaves, the frequency of those microwaves tells you something about the temperature of their source. And as I mentioned earlier, that microwave background is very uniform. What that means is the source temperature of everything in the universe was originally identical or very nearly so. The fluctuations are very tiny. And yet in the Big Bang model, when the universe, the universe is supposed to have popped into existence, uh, you know, there's a singularity where all, the, all, all of space is contained in a point and then it rapidly expands out like a balloon. The surface of the balloon represents the three dimensions of our space. And there should be hot spots and cold spots. That's just due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You, you would have to have, because of the uh, 
the, the small scale. You'd have to have places that are hot, places that have a lot of energy, places that are cool, places that have less energy. The universe rapidly expands out, carrying the hot spots and cold spots far away from each other. But wait a minute, they're all they're all lukewarm now. Okay, they, all those temperatures have evened out, and yet there hasn't been enough time for light to travel and therefore energy to travel from the hot spot to the cold spot to even out those temperatures, right? I mean, if the hot and cold were in contact with each other, they would eventually come to the same temperature because heat tends to go from hot to cold. That's the second law of thermodynamics. And so you put your ice cube in your hot coffee, eventually you'll end up with you know lukewarm coffee. They come to the same temperature, but they have to be in contact. They have to be able to exchange energy. And there hasn't been enough time, even if you give them the 13.8 billion years, there hasn't been enough time to light for light to travel from that hot spot to that cold spot because they could be on opposite sides of the visible universe. And so the uh, inflation is an attempt to solve that problem along with the flatness problem and perhaps the monopole problem. But the idea of inflation is that the universe started expanding at what we'll call the slow rate, although it's actually very fast. And then... Um, and then it suddenly ballooned out at a much faster rate. And then it, and then that inflation phase, that's the inflation phase. And then that switched off and it went back to the slow rate again. And so the idea is that the hot spots and cold spots could have evened each other out uh, right before this inflation phase pushed them far apart. And I'll grant that that could uh, reduce, maybe even solve the horizon problem, but it just, it introduces other problems of its own, such as what would cause this, what would cause the universe to suddenly expand at a much greater rate. Now there are hypotheses. It's well, you know, some kind of symmetry breaking in the in the laws of physics, and then you got to ask, what would it cause it? To, how would it stop everywhere? And how, well, how would it know to stop everywhere at the same time? That is a huge problem because uh, there are still small temperature differences. Even today, there are small temperature differences, and so if it's some kind of symmetry breaking, you would think it would turn off different places at different times, but it, it didn't. We have kind of a uniform universe, and so that's called the graceful exit problem. So the horizon problem, inflation, an attempt to solve the horizon problem, and then the graceful exit problem is a problem with inflation. And some secularists uh, reject inflation entirely because they realize it has its own issues and they've proposed alternative solutions to the horizon problem. But I think inflation is still the most commonly accepted secular solution to a problem. But as I said, it's got problems of its own. Wow, great answer. So they say we have a light travel time problem when in fact they're the ones with a massive light travel time problem. And then based on what yeah. you said, in order for them to solve that problem, it turns into a ripple effect of other hard to solve problems. And you pointed out that some uh, authorities on the subject even reject in inflationary theory for that reason. That's some, um, yep. And uh, I'll point out too, just in case anybody's wondering, yeah. Did the anisotropic synchrony convention solve their horizon problem? The answer is no, because they need to get the speed of light both ways to be much faster than it really is. Because it's not just the hot spots here that have to get information, have to dump energy to the cold spot there, but it's also a hot spot here that has to dump energy to a cold spot over there. So it has to be faster in both ways. And the anisotropic synchrony convention, you can only have light, you can only have light instant in one particular direction. Uh, relative to an observer. Now, it could be the incoming direction, regardless of what that is. Right. So, so north to south, if it's this way, and south to north, if it's that way. But you can't have it then going out in that same direction, be, be also instant. So uh, synchrony conventions will not solve the horizon problem. But we have, a, we have an answer for our starlight problem that is consistent with known physics, and the seculars really don't. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, great point there. And a couple questions came in in uh, pertaining to that answer. Let me see here. Um, guys, great questions in the chat. Very lively chat. I'll never be able to get to all of these. So let me at least pick a couple out. Super chat here from Jamie Russell. Thank you, Jamie. Can you explain how the universe doesn't have a center or could be infinite if we started as a point in Big Bang cos cosmology? Yeah, the... Uh entertaining for the sake of argument, the Big Bang idea, that the universe started from a point which expands like a balloon. The, the surface of the balloon, which is two-dimensional, is supposed to represent the three-dimensional nature of our universe. You can think about our universe, if, if, you, if you wish, you can think about it being wrapped around a fourth dimension that we can't perceive. And so just as the surface, there's no one point on the surface of a balloon that is the center, right? And so, uh, I mean, there's no unique center. I mean, every, every ants walking along the balloon, every one of them could say, I'm in the center, but so, you know, so could every other ant, but they're actually on the surface of a 
of an expanding two-dimensional structure, whereas uh, we apparently live in a three-dimensional structure that's expanding. If you want to think of it as being wrapped around a fourth dimension, you can do that, although it's, it's not really necessary mathematically for that to be the case. So, um, it, and, and, you know, even though I don't believe the universe started from a point, I do believe it's expanding. I think there's good evidence for that. And the balloon analogy, I think that's that works for a creationist universe too. It's just God created our balloon with size, and then He's blown it up a little bit since then. Our balloon was never a point, and uh, so uh, if that's the case, then there may be no unique center to our universe, or there could be a center. We don't really know. It could be that the galaxies end at some point. It could be that there are a finite number of galaxies in the universe, and that at some point there aren't any, and there's just space beyond that. It could be the case. It could be that our universe wraps around on itself. Uh, we, we don't really know. We don't really know. But any of those are possibilities. Right. Great answer. Yeah. Like I said before, this is such fascinating stuff. And um, let me see here. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll grab this one. I'll definitely get the Super Chats, guys. So um, Jungle Jargon for $5 asks, could the vacuum of space be causing the red shift? Uh, in a sense, that's actually the most common view, actually, because the idea is, um, you know, when people think of redshift, they think of a Doppler effect a lot of times, you know, just it, it, just the way the uh, sound of a car's horn changes as it goes past you, it, it drops. Light will do that too. Light will shift toward the red. It's much harder to see with light because, well, for two reasons. For one, it, the, the speed is just unimaginable. Light is so much faster than anything else we experience. And secondly, our eyes are not analyzers. Our eyes are synthesizers. We, our eyes combine uh, wavelengths into a color experience uh, where our ears don't do that. Our ears can separate sounds into different frequencies. So if I, if I hit two notes on a piano, you'll hear two notes. But if I shine two colors in a circle, you'll see one color. You'll see that it combined. So there's a difference there. But with spectroscopes, we can measure the, the shift of the spectral lines in these galaxies. And the farther away galaxies are, the more redshifted they are. And the initial explanation for that was, well, they're, they're moving away from each other, but probably a better explanation is that they're, you can think of them as being at rest on a universe that's actually expanding. And as the light travels through that expanding fabric of space, it gets stretched out. And so it's in the, in the most popular view, which I think is probably right, that the red shifts are caused not by Doppler shifts, but by expansion of the universe, at least the, on a cosmic scale. The, the, the reason the distant galaxies are redshifted is because of the stretching of the fabric of space as light travels through them. And so, uh, yeah, the vacuum of space probably is what's causing a lot of the redshifts, although motion will do it too. Awesome. I, I appreciate that answer, Dr. Lyle. And thanks for the super chat, Jungle Jargon. A lot of people enjoying this. Thanks for the conversation. Very informative. So I've got Dr. Lyle's um, website in the description box. So please check that out for more information on this. This has been awesome, Dr. Lyle. Mm -hmm.